the, the format of a concert is fairly, fairly well standardized thanks to the way that musical performances of, of the, the great masterworks have been spread all around the world since the invention of recording equipment. <laughs> uh, interpretations also become easily quite standardized. I think I met Daniel for the first time maybe, uh, what, six or seven years ago? I think at the Airwaves Festival in, 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 in Reykjavik. Kind of whenever somebody asks me, oh, who would you like to work with or who are the most interesting young composers, I've probably said his name to like a, a thousand different people in a thousand different instances. And I was, I was kind of really uh, excited by the language and by the... Uh, the handling of, of really massive uh, elements, uh, kind of tectonic plates of music, but also the uh, level of detail in the orchestra orchestrations and, you know, the music having a really heavy natural flow, but it being super detailed at the same time. I did go to Reykjavik in, um, in early June. I spent uh, a day there hanging out with, with Daniel. We even worked a little bit. You know, he had, he had written a few things and, uh, and I looked at them and, and was excited. And then I was just kind of giving him some, some uh, ideas of like special techniques or things that I, I use in improvised uh, situations. I think he had a very sort of feverish last few weeks of composing. Uh, I had a very feverish last few weeks of waiting for it to arrive. <laughs> but uh, yeah, now it's, it's beginning to be in my fingers and in my head and the rest of my system too. So um, everything's fine. <laughs> I mentioned earlier the, uh, some of the special techniques that we were discussing with Daniel when I met him. Um, one of them was a thing that I do quite often when I, um, I improvise, which is kind of doubling my own playing, either with my voice or with whistling. So when you play a pizzicato note, uh, in general it's quite a short sound. <laughs> if you have an open string you can <laughs> kind of stretch it out. But if you do, you can kind of create, create like a, a sustain. Using your voice, maybe you can do. He didn't write any. Um, any sort of voice moments into the actual violin part, but but as I said, there's like two improvised cadences, so we'll see if it if it fits in. The other thing that came into the piece that I kind of expected to have just as a as a short little thing is the changing of the tuning of the instrument in a way where you drop the the G string a fourth down to a D. So you get uh, you get an octave between the two lowest uh, strings on the violin. It always takes a little while for the string to get used to it. So you get this kind of raunchy. Mm. <laughs> um, that 
you don't normally get on a violin plus it makes kind of if the tuning is fine you can do this kind of octave things that wouldn't normally be so easy but one of the funny things about it is that it changes like the whole resonance of the of the violin there's a big difference when normally you play this note you would have kind of a um, resonance or like a a reverberation of the open G string now that the open G string doesn't exist anymore it's not there but instead of you get this kind of it the whole thing vibrates in a in a kind of different order than than normally and it's it's lovely as I said I expected Daniel to use the tuning thing as a special effect but it in fact became the, <laughs> the whole piece. I'm still kind of in a phase when I wake up in the morning. If I mistakenly play violin before having some coffee, I'll, I won't uh, remember where I am. young kid growing up learning the violin you already have a picture in your head how the Tchaikovsky concerto should sound but because of all of us fiddle players knowing kind of instinctively how David Oistrach or Jascha Heifetz or Itzhak Perlman would play a certain piece um, it's sometimes difficult to to kind of filter through just the just the message from the composer instead of all the hundreds of performances of the piece that you've heard. Um, I don't know a single musician who would say that this interpretation is now ready. Nobody can, nobody should do anything to it and it cannot be improved. Sometimes you feel a little bit like a square peg in a round hole. Like I should know the tradition, it would make this work easier. This only happens when you play standard repertoire. <laughs> When you have a piece that's written for you, nobody's going to come and tell you, well, you know, Heifetz didn't play it like that, um, because it didn't exist. For me, this kind of situation is ideal. And the best uh, is when you get a new piece by a composer that kind of many people in the profession are watching. And I know that a lot of my fiddle playing colleagues are interested in how this concerto turns out. We get to play it many times. And it's, it's, a, it's not only a great process of, of you know, learning, meeting, developing this piece. I'm expecting it to change in some ways everything else I do in, in music. We are creating, a, hopefully, a very flexible Bjarnason concerto tradition.